What's up everybody, welcome back to the VSO Gun Channel. Thanks for joining us here today. Today's video is very impromptu. In fact, uh, uh, shall not comply, 180 second ideas. My buddy Johnny over there, go ahead and check him out, link in the description box down below. So impromptu, in fact, that I am literally wearing my gym clothes. I ran back super quick today to get this video started before that thunderstorm gets here and it will most certainly get here before the end of today's video. But th today's gonna be a quick one on setting up a rifle. And I had no intentions of making today's video before when I woke up this morning. And I had, to be honest, until about 20 minutes ago. And the story goes like this. I received a call from a friend that said, hey man, can I come out and practice with my pistol? And for the majority of the people that I hang out with, this, this is not an abnormal statement. Uh, this particular person, it is. So I said, hey man, is everything all right? And they said, they gave me the situation. I'm like, all right, well, to be honest, pistol's good. Uh, but this sounds like a home defense situation. And the reason I carry a pistol everywhere I go is because I can't fit a rifle in my pants. It looks just really weird. There's not really a whole lot of room down there uh, with everything else I got going on. So I can't really get a rifle in my pants. So I make the trade off for the pistol. If it's a home defense situation, we want the biggest, scariest gun that we can possibly get. And we have a saying that is, uh, people shot with pistols, statistically speaking, and tongue-in-cheek for this thing, die later uh, or recover. And people shot with rifles and shotguns, DRT, or die right there. So we want the most effective weapon that we can possibly deploy in a self-defense situation, especially a home defense situation, uh, because we want to stop that threat as quickly as possible. And the best way to do that is rapid incapacitation with proper shot placement. However, we can take advantage of the ballistics of things like rifles if we have the option of doing it because we don't have to carry it around in public. So what I've done is because this person does not have the proper equipment, I'm setting up a rifle for them today to borrow until they can get one set up for themselves. And it looks a little bit like this. You guys have seen this one many times before on the channel. This is one of my personal rifles that I used for several years. It has basically been cleaned down and hung on the wall because I really don't have a whole lot of use for it anymore. And we're gonna be comparing this rifle today with my home defense rifle, which is this guy right here. And ideally, I would like to hand something like a short barrel rifle to this person. However, uh, I can't just hand a short barrel rifle to somebody because it's a regulated registered firearm, which is, I know, stupid. If you compare these rifles side by side, we have a 16 inch barrel right here and a 10.5 inch barrel. We trade the barrel length and the velocity on this gun for its maneuverability and its weight. This one obviously needs to be a 16 inch barrel so I can hand it to my friend. I can't just hand him this. That barrel's encased in Midwest Industries combat rail. Same thing on this one. And I think you're seeing a theme there. Midwest Industries has been knocking out of the park for a long period of time. They don't pay me to say that, but they absolutely could and I would take their money because they just do a really good job. In my opinion, the combat rail from Midwest Industries is the gold standard for what a rail should do. Also on the front, we can see that we have Midwest Industries fixed front sights and these things are super rugged. I beat the crap out of them. They're on a lot of my rifles. Really excellent fixed front sight, highly suggested as well. This one's got the ring, the HK ring type. This is the standard AR-15 type. On the end, okay, you'll see that we have comps on both of these. And I specifically picked this comp over here. Uh, I would have picked this one, but it was already mounted to my gun. So that's why it's like literally rock set in place. It's not coming off. This one is the second loudest comp that I have, and it was actually a spare Seekins Precision comp. And when I'm setting a gun up for home defense purposes, I want the most obnoxious thing I can possibly get on the end. The gun's gonna be loud when you shoot it indoors, period. It doesn't even matter if it's got a silencer on the end of it. It is going to be horrifically loud. If it's gonna be loud enough to damage your hearing, it might as well be as scary as possible. And uh, my buddy John Level put out a full video on this. Uh, I'll refer you to his rationale behind why we want the gun as loud as we possibly can inside the home. I provided a video for you guys on YouTube. I'll provide a link for you right up here or down in the description or something like that. But in that video, I was holding this AR and I said, for a home defense gun, I'd take this can off. And everyone lost their minds.
He has the experience. We'll just leave it at that. I 100% concur with him though. I want it as loud and obnoxious as I possibly can get. So this one's Seekins Precision. That one's another Midwest Industries product, their two-chamber brake. They're super cheap too. I mean, not cheap, they're cost-effective. Uh, highly suggested there as well. I went ahead and ripped off my spare light off of this gun. I have two home defense rifles actually, so I ripped this a 800 lumen Enforce off of there. Home defense rifles should absolutely have a light on them. So this one will be replaced because I did this run really quick and I've got to find a spare one to put on this thing. You'll notice that both of these wear the Trigicon MRO. They're both in one third co-witness mounts. This particular rifle has a tourniquet attached to the back of it and that's not an accident. The tourniquet won't really fit on this folding stock, the Deadfoot Arms MCS. Doesn't really work well with a tourniquet on it, but this one has actually been mounted on this rifle for probably a couple years now. As far as rear sights on this one, I've gone ahead and set this thing up in the large aperture on the Mag Magpul Embus Pro that was, no, that's not a Pro. That's a Gen 2. Yeah, that's a Gen 2 uh, flip up iron sight there. I've gone ahead and set it up for the large aperture. So in low light conditions, we'll be able to see through that very well. And both these guns have Radian Raptors in them uh, for proper use of the charging handle. Now we're gonna talk about zero. And if I have some hard cuts in here, guys, I apologize. I'm getting eaten alive by bitey flies. They're trying to get in their last snack before it rains. And uh, so I apologize in advance, but there are two zeros for the 5.56 cartridge, in my opinion. They are 50 and 25 yards. If you use anything besides 50 or 25 yards, in my opinion, it's wrong. And uh, especially not the 100 yard zero, the 100 yard zero absolutely takes things from you that you can very easily gain by using the 25 or 50 yard zero. And you should select that zero based on what you want your rifle to do. So this rifle should have a 50 yard zero on it already unless bacon screwed with it. And this one is gonna have a 25 yard zero by the time we're done today. I have no idea what it's doing right now because I just kind of threw the sight on it uh, as uh, I ripped it off of an, another gun and basically the 50 yard zero is what I call the utility zero and that's a gun that I have intentions of possibly shooting past 50 yards on a semi-regular basis. The 50 yard zero gives you zero to 50 but then also sets you up in a, such a manner that your ballistic curve allows you to consistently strike targets out to 400 yards relatively consistently. And I will say that with a short barrel rifle like this 10.5. If you do your part, you can consistently hit a 400 yard target with a 50 yard zero with a red dot. If you do your part, the rifle will do its. The 25 yard zero, by contrast, that is a rifle that I have absolutely no intention, 99.99999% of the time of shooting anything past 25 yards. So that's what we're gonna be setting this thing up. This is literally the like CQB zero that I'm going to use, which is, hey, I may need fairly precise shots inside of 25 yards. That's this, and that's what we're gonna be doing right now. I'm gonna show you the difference between the two after we get the thing set up. And we're not gonna do any long range shooting today uh, because we're gonna get rained on, but just understand that the 50 yard zero is gonna give you a flatter trajectory between the 50 yard mark and the 400 yard mark, such to the point that you should be able to place a bullet, if, again, if you do your part, inside of a standard steel plate uh, at any of those distances in between without doing a, any holdovers or anything of, of, the, of the like. And that works for both your full length rifle, so your, like your 16 inch gun, your 18 inch gun, and your shorties down to about 10 inches in, in, in length. So anything less than that, you're gonna really deviate from that. You are gonna deplete enough velocity that you're going to have to do some holdovers at those distances. But your 10.5 should be able to handle it out to those distances without a whole lot of effort. So the 25 yard zero though, gives us a closer approximation to the, the distances that we're gonna be using so that we can use that red dot for super precise shots inside that distance. Remember that anything inside the zero, the bullet is gonna hit low. We have height over bore considerations that we have to uh, contend with. If the optic is zeroed for 25 yards, for instance, everything inside of 25 yards is gonna be some derivative of the distance between the center line of the optic and the center line of the bore. Same thing at 50 yards, some derivative of 
the center line of the optic and the center line of the bore is where that bullet is going to strike the target. So keep those in mind. That's again, one of the reasons why we used a 25 yard zero for that super close stuff. Good to go. So the cool thing about having irons on your gun is if you keep your iron zeroed, and I know that I zeroed the irons on this thing, you know, years ago, then you have a pretty good chance of hitting the target if you just co-witness your red dot with your sight. Now to do that, make sure that if you're using a dual aperture sight, you flip it up to the fine aperture. And right now I'm seeing a little bit of windage deviation, ever so slightly, okay. And now that I've done that, I have an eight inch gong down there at the other end, and I almost guarantee that I'm within that eight inch gong before we even hang up any paper. There you go. And then just to confirm. hang up some paper. 25 yards. Uh, we're going to shoot both guns at 25 yards. Remember, one should already have a 50 yard zero. And then I just put a 25 yard on this one. Now this may or may not seem all that impressive to you. But uh, this is the 25 yard zero out of the 16 inch gun. And then this is my two shot group with the short barrel rifle, 50 yard zero, 25 yard uh, target. So uh, you can see there's a little bit of deviation here and it's not that big of a deal until we start moving in closer and the deviation becomes a little bit more prolific. I've come in considerably. I have no idea what the yardage is, but it's, it's much shorter than the 25 yards. I'd say it's at least three quarters of the way to the target. So if we take this 50 meter zero gun and I want to say, make a headshot at this distance. My point of aim was all the way up here. See how much deviation we had? And if you look at that, we can see that point of aim and point of impact basically equals the distance between the center line of the optic, center line of the bore. So when we're talking about using a 25 meter zero, uh, we can shrink this distance a little bit. So with the 16 inch gun with the 25 yard zero, we can see that we get basically another half inch. All right, guys and girls, well, that about wraps it up for us here today. Again, impromptu video, sorry for the haphazardly thrown together production value of the thing, but uh, I wanted to get this thing done quick today. We did beat the rain, which was surprising to me. It kind of diverted a little bit south, which was odd <laughs> for this time of year. But the reason I made this video is there was one point that I wanted to drive home. And I thought this was a good way to convey it. And that is that the correct answer is to seek out competent professional firearms training. I know it's expensive to do that, but it's not just enough to go to the range and shoot a whole bunch of bullets. I do probably two or three firearms training courses under somebody else on a yearly basis, even with all the load of ammunition that I shoot on a regular basis because I'm no longer in charge. You are not the head honcho at that point in time when you attend a firearms training course. It can be very humbling at times, uh, but it's important that somebody else is working your mind besides yourself. And I think that is one of the major take homes. And I would also say, even though it's expensive, that everything that we did here today, or pretty much 90% of the stuff that we do on a regular basis here, you can figure out yourself by shooting a whole bunch of bullets. Um, if you get a truckload of 5.56 and just sat down and just did it, yeah, you could probably figure out everything. But it's gonna be expensive, more expensive than if you had just gone to a training course and had them tell you tell it to you. In fact, I would say that the shock for me was when I attended my first firearms training course, legitimate firearms training course, that everything that I learned up to that point was covered in probably the first five, 10 minutes. So you get kind of the primer at the beginning and you're just like, wow, that's everything that I thought there was to this. And then no, there's a lot more to it. 
So there's that. And then there's the aspect of you're no longer driving the bus. So even if you are, if you're new, then definitely. If you're seasoned, then definitely as well, because there may be a different perspective that you didn't think about. You may pick up some things that I almost guarantee that if the instructor is worth their salt, that you will pick up something that you didn't know before. And that is exceptionally valuable. You never know when you're going to have to pull that thing out. So again, the take home is seek out competent professional firearms training above and beyond what's required by law. And that'll just make you not only a better shooter, but also a more uh, prepared and competent United States citizen. Now, today's caveat is that I highly suspect that this person that I'm about to hand this rifle to will never ever touch it again. I hope they never have to touch it again for any defensive purpose, but it is my strong suspicion that they will probably never even make it to getting their own rifle, let alone training with it. We try to filter the people that come in and out of our lives and guide them, but that always doesn't stick. And that's the situation we're in here today. So anyway, that is my soapbox for today. Thanks for watching the VSO Gun Channel. I hope that uh, you learned something here today. If you did, then hit that subscribe button down below. Like, share, and around, all that sort of stuff. And hopefully we did a good enough job to get you to come back for a future video here at the VSO Gun Channel. Big guy. Ooh, it smells good in here. It smells good. How come we don't have a... We're going to do a thousand rounds today. How come we don't have a fun lever here? Uh, that's a serious question. That's why we have the lighter trigger in it, is because we want it to be a little more real world. Oh, okay. I, I see how this is.